I invite you to join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, help us to always remember who we are and how we get to live because of who Jesus is and what he did to save us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Who am I? Three short little words, but boy, when they're put together, uh, they form a very powerful and profound question, don't they? A question that revolves around our identity. Who am I? And it's a question that we often wrestle with at times, depending upon what we're going through in life. Our identity can be shaped and changed so quickly by so many things, by who we know, by what we do, by what we've done, by what's been done to us or for us, or what others say of us. Have you ever noticed how easy it is for our culture and our circumstances to define our identity? Let me give you an example uh, from my own personal life. A big part of my identity is to be a pastor. And my favorite time of the year to be a pastor is December. It's a busy time of the year, but it's also a wonderful time of the year. I love the Advent services. I love the Christmas services. I love all the special Christmas events and gatherings. I love the Christmas parties. I also love seeing college students as they return home and other family and friends as they return to spend Christmas together. But this past December, I didn't feel like a pastor. That's because I couldn't do the things that a pastor normally does in December. Instead, I felt like a patient who was struggling to recover from a surgery and all of its complications, and still am. (laughs) You're stuck with me today because the other two pastors are gone today. But isn't it weird how our circumstances can shape how we feel about ourselves and who we think we are? Now, I'm not saying being a pastor is my whole identity, but it's certainly a big part of it. And boy, when something happens that takes a part of our identity away from us, it can really be difficult then to answer that question, who am I? And there are so many ways our culture tries to identify us. There's all kinds of different identifiers thrown at us. And I just want to throw out a list for you to see how easy our culture can shape and form our identity. I'm single, engaged, married, separated, divorced, widowed. I'm a doctor, lawyer, business owner, homeowner, executive, cashier, chef, teacher. I'm a conservative, moderate, liberal, libertarian, progressive. I'm employed, unemployed, retired, on welfare, on disability. I'm black, I'm white, I'm brown. I'm yellow. I'm red. I'm into academics. I'm into athletics. I'm into music. I'm into drama. I'm into robotics. I'm a victim of an accident or abuse or abandonment, burglary or fraud. I'm an addict or I love someone who's an addict. I'm upper class, middle class, lower class. I'm a fan of this team, but not that team. I'm gluten intolerant lactose intolerant, vegan, carnivore. (laughs) I'm vaccinated, unvaccinated, boosted, a mask wearer, not a mask wearer. You get the idea? The list could go on and on, couldn't it? And you were probably thinking of different things I could have added to that list. But all these different identifiers that are thrown at us have a way of shaping how we answer that question, who am I? But in that shaping of the answer to that question, who am I? What happens with all of this separating and subdividing us into categories based on these different identifiers? It can actually cause us to experience division with others and a distorted sense of our own identity. Now think about it. Can any of these or any combination of these earthly identifiers or others that maybe came to your mind really give you your true identity? Or is there something bigger? Is there something more significant that can answer that question, who am I? Is there something bigger and more significant that can help you discover your true identity? Well, the last question, the answer is yes. Today, as we remember the baptism of Jesus, what we're going to discover is in his baptism, we not only see the identity of Jesus Uh, being unwrapped, 
but we also see our own identity being unwrapped in our own baptism. Now, as you heard Philomena read the, the gospel reading, there were some amazing things that happened at Jesus' baptism, right? We heard that the Holy Spirit, as Jesus was praying and being baptized, the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form as a dove. We're also told that there was a voice coming down from heaven that said, you are my son whom I love with you, I am well pleased. Do you see how the voice of the heavenly father is helping us to understand the identity of Jesus? So Jesus is more than just the son of Mary and Joseph. In fact, right after this uh, baptism of Christ, Luke goes into the genealogy of Jesus, and it starts this way. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph. See, people looking at Jesus and Mary and Joseph would say, well, Joseph is Jesus' father. But what God is declaring here in his baptism is, no, Joseph is Jesus' stepfather. As Jesus made that, or as God made that declaration from heaven, he was saying to Jesus, I am your father. That's what he was saying. Jesus is the eternal son of God. And not only is he God's son, but we're told he's also loved by God and he's well-pleasing to God because he was willing to obey his father's will and come into this world to save us. And in his baptism, his earthly ministry gets its beginning. Now, you may be wondering, so what does Jesus' identity have to do with my identity? Let's go back to those words once again. God said to Jesus, you are my son whom I love. With you, I'm well pleased. That's what he said to him at his baptism. That's the same thing he says to us in our baptism. You are my son. You are my daughter whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. That's where our true identity is found. Through baptism, we have been declared a son or daughter of God. And that's not an identity that just lasts for a season or lasts for a lifetime. It's an identity that lasts for eternity. And this is what it means when you start to understand that you're a son or daughter of God. It means that you're loved by God the Father. So no matter what you do or what you go through, he's going to love you. It means you're indwelt and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So that means you're never alone and you never have to figure out how to manage life in this sin-broken world with your own resources. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. It means you're living a new life in Christ. So in baptism, the old is being replaced by the new because you're living in what, who Christ is and what he's done for you. It also means you will live with God forever. In other words, your eternity is safe and secure. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? How can we be sons or daughters of God? Well, the reason is simply because that's what he's declared us to be in baptism. Because what he does in baptism is he personally unites us with the saving work of his son. In baptism, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come down to us so that we're personally connected with his death, his burial, and his resurrection. I'd encourage you uh, sometime this week to look at Romans chapter 6 because it lays this out beautifully as Paul describes this union that happens in baptism. In verses 3 to 5, St. Paul writes, Oh, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have a new life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we'll certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So it's not just Jesus who experienced some amazing things in baptism. We do too. We're baptized into Christ. We're united with Christ in his death. We're buried with Christ in his tomb. And we will be united with Christ in his resurrection. So in other words, all Jesus is and all Jesus has done is for you. And it's for eternity. And that's what shapes our ultimate identity. Now, if that's true, and God's word says it's true, then what should you and I do? Well, the best starting place is we should remember. Remember what God did for you in baptism. Remember who he declares you to be in baptism, his, his son or his daughter. Remember that you're now freed from slavery to sin and death through baptism. And remember that through baptism, God shows he loves you and he's well pleased with you. Not because of who you are, or because of what you've done, but because of who he is 
and what he's done to save you. And as you remember those things, then God will help you to die to sin and live for God. That's what Jesus did, and St. Paul writes about that in the next verses. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So Jesus died to sin once for all, to pay for the guilt and the punishment of uh, our sin that we deserved. But because he rose and conquered death, sin and death have no mastery over him. He's now the master over sin and death. And he lives to God. And so we can too, because we are forgiven and free. St. Paul ends with these words. He says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Because we're baptized into Christ, we're no longer slaves to sin. We have a new master. We can be dead to sin and we can be alive to God. And until Christ's return to take us to our eternal home, we get to live out this identity every day as God's holy children who are united not only with Christ, but with one another through our baptism. That is who we are individually and collectively. Amen.